Our New Testament reading today is from Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 21. If you'd like to follow along with me, it's in your pew Bible on page 188. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood self-condemned. For until certain people came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But after they came, he drew back and kept himself separate for fear of the circumcision faction. And the other Jews joined him in a hypocrisy, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not acting consistently with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is justified not by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And we have come to believe in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by doing the works of the law, because no one will be justified by the works of the law. But if in our effort to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. But if I build up again the very things that I once tore down, then I demonstrate that I am a transgressor. For though the law I died for through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if justification comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. This is the word of God.
Let us pray. Almighty and loving God, quiet our minds and let us receive the message that you wish us to hear. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation from my heart be a blessing to you and all who hear. Amen. What is a covenant? Well, it's a binding agreement, perhaps at times even a legal agreement. But with God, a covenant is a promise to uphold. From the dawn of biblical times, a story of God can be visualized as a faith-filled adventure of humanity attempting to live in relations. Relations with the light and darkness, relations with earth and water, relationships with wild, or wildlife, relations with the elements of client, climate and shelter, relations with other human beings, and ultimately, I think, trying to relate to the how and why everything came to be. And as the story goes, in the beginning, God created. And when he created human beings, he placed them in a garden where they began their right relationship. The Creator walked in the garden with them while the cool evening breeze rustled through the trees. And God promised to be with them always, provide for their needs, and even said, humanity can eat from any tree but the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For the day that you eat from that tree, you will die, God said. And our promise, our relations, our covenant will be broken. Humanity would need mercy, they would need protection, and they would need the promise of hope for divine, eternal relations in order to be right again. In our lesson today, the Apostle Bahal believes that Christ is the fulfillment of our much-needed new promise, the covenant of grace and salvation. So let's take a little history lesson uh, regarding who these covenant people of God were and continue to be. The Jewish people first and foremost believed that Yahweh, God, is the one and only true God of Israel. They are a covenant people of faith chosen by Yahweh's mercy to be in relationship with the Creator, which continues on to their long-standing religious belief system. God promised to protect them, the people of Israel, and they in turn promised to maintain all the rituals and the laws that God had given. And in time, those laws and commandments were sent by God through Moses on Mount Sinai to assist the people further in living these commandments and their covenant relationship. But today we find ourselves in the New Testament lessons of Galatians. For the new believers and followers of Jesus, the Jews and the Gentiles, some of the present day leadership continues to insist that the works of the law, i.e. the written covenant, must remain valid. And for some leaders, even the continuation of circumcision rituals must remain. But Paul disagrees. Through his own new faith experience with Christ, he appears to be challenging Peter, Cephas, and others in leadership. For Paul, in light of what God has done in Christ, the law has served its purpose in salvation history. The dividing wall between Jews and Gentiles has now come down. God is now receiving all who place their trust in Christ, regardless of cultural rituals and devotion to the law of Moses. And why does Paul disagree so adamantly? It's because he remembers his scriptures. He remembers the promise of God to Abraham. 
Yahweh has promised Abraham will have a son, even in his old age. And he has promised that salvation will come through Abraham's seed, the future generation of his children, including the long-awaited birth of a Messiah. Now Paul knows from these lessons that the promise came long before the covenant of God's people was made on Mount Sinai. So Paul no longer believes that the law justifies our right relationships with God because in his mind, the law was never intended to justify. It was meant to be a guide to follow for everyday living. For Paul, it comes down to Abraham's faith, his belief in God and the belief that God's promises of salvation will come to all humanity, and they will come through Abraham's children. It is Abraham's faith in God that is the fulfillment of the covenant promise that is to come. And so, for Paul, there seems to be a confusion about what's being taught in Galatia. Paul insists that the whole purpose of Jesus' death on the cross was to set us free from adhering to the Jewish laws and rituals. He insists that the gospel is about what God has done through Jesus, not what we do to help ourselves. One of the great debates among scholars is how to properly translate the Greek phrase that comes in Galatians uh, 16, verse 16 of chapter 2. It says, justified by, and this is the Greek, pistu hezu Christu. For some, this, is, this interpretation is saying that we are justified by faith in Christ, while others interpret it as justified by, uh, by the faithfulness of Jesus. Now, this may seem like a theological, trivial um, point to bring up, but it actually is something that we need to look at, I believe. The first version, faith in Jesus Christ, emphasizes that it is our faith that saves us. The alternative, justified by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, emphasizes that it is what God has done through Jesus' faith and his obedience that saves us. I have a suggestion. Perhaps we need both prepositions. I mean, yes, faith is a gift from God, and we are called to be obedient, but by believing in Christ, are we not doing something? Are we working? at helping ourselves to gain salvation? In fact, if we look at verse 21, Paul says that if our internal, eternal destiny depends on anything that we do, then Christ has died for nothing. For Paul, the biblical witness and the most individuals regarding and for most individuals regarding themselves as Christians, our eternal destiny, destiny is secured solely by what Jesus did and nothing else. So, theologically, I guess the reasoning that justifies why, I guess that I can see this reasoning that justifies why some of the scholars choose to translate Pistu Jesu Christu as the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. But we don't have to decide that today. You can work on that on your own, or you can call me later on. But I think that the important part to remember is that we don't want to be exclusive in the way that we define this. We want to be able to think of it as an inclusive way of inviting all to the gospel of grace. For now, let's just agree on one thing, that faith, is the active involvement of God's grace toward creation. 
Now I'm guessing in Paul's day, and possibly even here in 2016, the apostles, or our many leaders, are struggling with self-identification of these new worshiping communities following the teachings of the risen Lord. As the new congregation pushed out into largely Gentile communities, questions arise regarding the believer's relationship to the law of Moses and to Judaism as a system, as a religious system. PCUSA teaching elder Reverend Dr. Alan Brim suggests it's as if they are asking themselves, was the church to open the doors wide for all newcomers? Were her boundaries to be as wide as the entire human race? Or was she, the church, only to be an extension of Judaism to the Gentiles? I believe Paul's letter to the Galatians addresses these questions. On the surface, today's passage is talking about works righteousness versus salvation by God's grace alone. But for Paul, I feel our lesson is deeper than that. Paul is very upset with Peter, or Cephas, as we hear in the readings. Each of the apostles has been commissioned to share this good news of God's grace that is available to all, be that Jew or Gentile. In other words, following the way of Christ in these new religious communities allowed everyone to be equal players because they all shared one thing in common, the grace of God through Jesus Christ, regardless if they were Jew or non-Jew. According to Paul, Peter is practicing double standards while he's in the presence of these new converts, as well as in when he's standing around the leadership of the Jewish community. When it comes to cultural practices and the gospel of grace, Peter is picking and choosing which one he wants to do depending on who his audience is. Paul wants everyone to be included regardless of cultural practices requiring circumcision or dietary rules. And it's as if he's pleading. These traditions are not what makes us followers of Christ. It is what God has done through Christ and our belief in this powerful grace of our Creator. Paul does not want to create a new religion with new ritual practices. He feels deep in his heart that God's love is so plentiful that he is willing to promote a sense, as one scholar notes, a sense of plurality of the essence of the ultimate truth of the gospel. We are saved by grace through faith. I mean, think about it. Here we are as Presbyterians. We have Baptist friends. We have Catholic friends, Lutheran friends, evangelical, non-denominational, maybe even some Muslim friends. And perhaps we even have friends that consider themselves spiritual and not religious. And yet, somehow, we all hold on to a common denominator of truth. Our faith, our belief system, is something far greater than ourselves. And this provides a means of hope, forgiveness, comfort, assurance, and the willpower to continue to experience, share, and extend God's love, the good news that we can encounter whether we are Jew or Gentile. Yes, our denominations and religious traditions do have the potential to make us communities of exclusivity. And sure, it's natural to have a sense of allegiance to the Presbyterian Church. Most of us sitting here are Presbyterians this morning. But as for Peter, well, Paul's upset with him because he just kind of keeps jumping back and forth, not quite sure where or who he's supposed to be. Paul is so upset, he cries out and says, Peter, you're a hypocrite. Stop riding the fence. Your life, live your life as the risen Lord is in you. 
Yes, you can uphold those Jewish rituals, but don't expect non-Jews to participate in them just because they now believe in the gospel of grace. It's not the law that saves us. In fact, it never did. It's God's grace through Christ, faith, and obedience. Come on, Peter. Don't you get it? Paul had his own transformation of faith experience on that road to Damascus when he was persecuting the early Christians. And it was that experience of divine love that God gave him that changed his whole understanding and brought him back into a right relationship with the Creator. Are you guys still awake out there? Are you hearing this good news? Okay, well, it is this new understanding that through faith in or of Jesus Christ, that God has the power to recenter one's mind, one's heart, and spirit so that we can begin to open our lives publicly for the betterment of the world, revealing Jesus' intimate nature and the spirit of Christ's faith that lives within each and every one of us. In other words, the whole world has the opportunity to see and experience faith, Christ indwelling of our hearts and our souls as we participate with God's grace and love toward all humanity. Simply put, today Paul is calling each of us to coexist through the power of God's grace with all humanity, regardless of religious or non-religious backgrounds. Think this is a pretty tall order? It might be. It might be for many of us. But I think this is when the gift of faith must step in, and I believe Paul would agree. Because, yeah, there are differences to, and rules to identify us and separate us as communities, but these rules and rituals and identities don't make us right with God. Yeah, they're important to maintain a sense of structure or decent order and perhaps even assist in our health and well-being. But hear what Paul is saying. If following the rules is what, take, what it takes in our lives to be right with God, then Christ died for no purpose toward all of humanity. My friends, Jesus Christ's life and death did mean something. It meant something for you, and it meant something for me and all the people that are beyond these walls because it's Christ's faith in God, his daily living actions, his obedience to death and his assurance in the miracle of the resurrection provides the means for each of us here today to be right with God. How? Again, by faith, believing that Christ did die for all humanity, for you, for me, for our neighbors, for the widow, for the one whose body is riddled with infection, for the one whose son or daughter has been sent off to fight, even the one who's lost in depression, who no longer believes in anything, much less a higher power. This past week, some of us may recall our own personal memories of the late boxing champion, Muhammad Ali. You may have been a fan of his uh, for his athletic abilities. You may have appreciated uh, his voice to stand up against fighting in the Vietnam War with, under his name and religion. Uh, you may even admire him because he still did this and he lost his t championship title and he lost three years of his athletic abilities during his prime. 
Perhaps you're one that admires him for his philanthropic actions in his later years, even while he was battling Parkinson's disease. Or maybe you just respected Ali because he was a public witness to his faith in God. He was a man of faith. Whatever it is that you remember or admire, one thing alone stands out to me over this last week, and particularly this past Friday. And what that is is that the masses of individuals that came to worship with each other, respecting the life of Muhammad Ali. People from all different backgrounds came together to honor his life and his accomplishments. They came together to worship before God, the Creator, the Almighty, the Peace Giver, the Comforter. They came to worship before Allah, to worship before the truth, the mystery, and the grace. Now, obviously, these people came together to this funeral service because they were extending their respects to the family, but I know that something more took place in that holy, grace-filled setting. The people gathered as individuals from multiple backgrounds, various religious traditions, Christians, Muslim, Jews, agnostics, and perhaps even those practicing different traditions altogether. But they came out of respect and love to share in the divine mystery of hope and comfort, perhaps not even realizing that God's grace would touch them in that holy place. And ultimately, I feel that all that gathered left experiencing the hand of God's love and mercy on their lives, maybe without even understanding how or why. For you see, I believe that the divine mysteries of God can and were revealed in this public place, remembering this man's life and his faith. And by that power of God's mercy, I know in my heart that the gift of grace was extended to all during their experience. My friends, is your heart searching this hour for fulfillment? Do you need a sense of hope or some healing? Do you feel separated from love or from mercy? And if you long for genuine forgiveness, listen to your heart. In this holy place, God can and will touch you with loving grace. Believe me, you too can be restored. You too can be renewed by the loving hand of God and God alone through Christ Jesus, who is the fulfillment of the covenant promise. Do each of you believe 